Why does the Synod on Synodality want public sinners to receive communion? It's all about a brotherhood, baby. Wait, it's all about Freemasonry? Wait, what? Meanwhile, the Bully Church of Accompaniment refuses communion to a faithful father on his knees. Flashback ten years ago, the late Bishop Tony Palmer explains what's really going on at the Synod. The good news? Michael Matt interviews Cardinal Gerhard Muller, and Bishop Joseph Strickland offers the Latin Mass. Hashtag stand with Strickland, stand with Muller, and Burke, and Zen, and Schneider, and Sarah, and... Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Michael Matt, and this is The Revenant Underground. Man, what a week. Lots been going on. Hopefully later in our program we'll have a few moments left at the end of the show to talk about the Catholic Identity Conference. I mean, it was such a huge success, such a grace-filled thing, and I think sent a clear message around the world, including to the Vatican, that at least here in America we've got a united front. Again, of course, there were powerful people, Vatican cardinals and bishops and archbishops over there. It's fantastic. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, we're also going to touch on the Synod on Stupidality, which is now in full, in full swing. I, I wish we could just skip over that because the, the stupid factor is so high, it's making me crazy. But uh, we'll, we'll touch on that. Uh, but I also, before we get started, I really want to just um, touch briefly on this latest dust-up in Tradville. Last evening, my friend, Archbishop Carla Maria Vigano, and I had a constructive discussion. <laughs> Those of you who want to see this thing go get worse, you want to exacerbate it, <sighs> breathe. Just take a little break. You know, I said in the video that we did right after the conference that Archbishop Vigano and I are going to work it out. That's exactly what we're doing, you know. So please, do what you can to calm this little tempest in the traddy teapot and let it go. Because the reality is, friends, and this is something we can all agree on, regardless of where we come down on the standing of this man Francis, Francis is the problem, you know? And this situation really doesn't have a human solution. It's out of control now, of course. And you have men like Bishop Schneider and Archbishop Carla Maria Vigano, they're agreeing on that much, that this is going to have to be a God thing, that only God ultimately can sort it out. So what does that mean? That means for little people like us, we don't have to worry about it so much, which was the point of the show three weeks ago. What we need to do is just unite, you know, continue to say our prayers, unite in a massive, again, massive demonstration of American strength and solidarity against Francis and against his attempted hostile takeover of the Catholic Church, also stand with, we're going to get to this in a moment, the cardinals and archbishops now who are standing against the Synod on Synodality right now in Rome. They need to look across the sea at America, the traditional movement, and they need to see support from us. That's crucial. We're going to get to that in a moment. I want to do a shout out, first of all, to our friends in London. I'm going to be joining them. We're talking about Family Life International UK Conference, which is coming up. It's going to be held in London, UK, on the 14th of October. And their theme, I guess, their general theme, Raising Children in a Society Burdened with Pagan Ideologies. It sounds like a very timely conference, which is why I'm going to speak at it. And I understand there are still a few seats available, so click this link right down here below if you'd like to join us. And if you can't be in London next week, just click the link anyway, and you can join us. You can zoom in, as it were, uh, for free. Also, <laughs> if the asteroid doesn't hit first, Remnant TV will be in Rome during the Synod. Not sure what we're going to find there. Not even sure how much they're going to, the Vatican Press Office is going to be allowed to share with journalists. But we'll find out. And whatever we find out, we're going to report back to you on a daily basis. So watch for that. And then after the Synod in Rome, I will be speaking at the Rome Life Forum right down the street from the Vatican. We're going to be sifting through the ruins, I guess, after the, after the Synod detonates. So, again, His Eminence, uh, Cardinal Muller will be there, Bishop Strickland will be there, John Henry Weston will be there speaking. All these guys are going to be speaking along with a whole lineup of great speakers who are going to be... Uh, just, as I say, sifting through the ruins. So hope to see you there, October 31st in Rome. Now, to the Synod. I think, again, people say, well, what's the good news? Like, what, we all know how bad it is. We all, the gnashing of teeth and the terrorizing and the terrifying events that are going on or projected to be going on over there. What's the good news? And the good news, I think, is that this is a, an enlightening moment for millions and millions and millions of Catholics. So they're going to see things now. They're just going to go, whoa, 
what happened to the Catholic Church. We're already seeing that, aren't we? That's the good news. Everybody knows that something has gone way wrong. You have to be a, you got to be a total Jesuit to think that all is well in the Eternal City in 2023. You got, you got to really be out there. You see, and of course, none of this comes as a surprise to us, right? None of that's a traditional Catholic. It's a remnant TV, the remnant newspaper. Well, well, we've been talking about this day coming for a half a century. None of it is a surprise. So in a way, as I've said before, lots of people are depressed, and I am too for what's happening to the church, but the clarity is deeply appreciated. The fact that they can't call us nuts anymore, crazy, paranoid, you know, folks uh, anymore is good. Everybody's looking at the remnant and going, hmm, I guess the tragedies were right, right? Because you said, y'all said this was coming for a long, long time. And again, this brings us back to a key point. Francis did not start the fire. This is not about Francis 100%. Francis is doing, he's just carrying, he's on the continuum. He's doing the thing that they've been doing for a long, long time. It's just that now the Catholic Church, the Catholic people have been so incredibly under-catechized and dumbed down that most of them have no idea how to fight back. Most of them really aren't even interested in fighting back. They're not going to Mass anymore. They really don't even care. Most Catholics in the world today. But again, we've been warning against it for 50 years, so there's no surprise. Check out, for example, this vintage remnant cartoon on the fruits of Vatican II. Now, you can read those words. Those are the fruits, starting back at the trunk of the tree, ecumenism, collegiality, annulments, the new mass, of course, communion in the hand, altar girls, Assisi. And now, friends, you've just got the synod from hell reaching far out on the branch for married clergy, women priests, and of course, blessing gay unions. See? That's a vintage cartoon because we knew this was coming. It was inevitable. The modernist revolution, friends, and this is the part that's tough. I know we talked about it at the Catholic Identity Conference. A lot of traditionalists, the, 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 the face of traditional Catholicism is changing because so many people came in in the middle of the most recent crisis, the COVID crisis, right? found the traditional Latin Mass when the churches were, were shut and locked up. And so they don't realize this. They tend to think this is all about Francis. But ultimately, friends, the, the more you dig into this, the more you cling to the Latin Mass and fall in love with the traditions of the faith, the more you're going to realize that the modernist revolution came out of the closet at Vatican II. That's 1965 when the council closed. You have to take it back there. You know, and now this branch is breaking <laughs> to the point now where the Pope, the guy in white in Rome, can't even tell the world basic, you can't even give basic answers, such as why did Jesus Christ suffer and die on the cross? Cuando a mí me hacen una de estas preguntas, confieso con toda sinceridad, no sé responder. Eh, pero usted estudió teología, filosofía. Pero no sé responder. ¿Y sabes por qué? Porque no hay respuestas. Lo único que me viene es mirar el crucifijo y preguntar por qué Dios dejó crucificar a su hijo. Tampoco hay respuesta. Let me enlighten the Holy Father. Jesus Christ suffered and died for our sins. By the way, this enlightenment comes from what I was taught in the first grade, okay? By the Catholic nuns in Catholic schools. The question he just couldn't answer. Jesus Christ suffered and died for our sins. Jesus Christ suffered and died on the cross in order to open the gates of heaven to redeem the world. So if you would stop thinking about the weather, maybe you would come around to figure out why, why it is that you should be teaching the world more about what Jesus Christ did and why he died on the cross. You see, you don't even know, Holiest. <laughs> Let's say climate change is real. Maybe that's a punishment from God then. Maybe he's literally burning up the world because we're all languishing in sin and remaining obstinate in our sin and trashing the family and hacking up kids and killing babies. You know what? We kind of deserve to have the planet burn up holiness. Maybe if you were to teach people how to repent and return to God, we could solve the climate crisis at the same time. But I know you're not going to do that, are you, holiness? And so Pope Francis this week just cranked out a little sequel to Laudato Si.
Today, a single generation can experience the acceleration of global warming. We're not talking about centuries or millennia, but just a few years. We do not have to look far to find the cause. It is us. In Laudato Si, Pope Francis already addressed the consequences of the process of environmental degradation. Over these eight years, the planet has continued to suffer from our attacks. To change this trend, multilateral agreements among states are essential. It is necessary that world organizations have a real authority to ensure that the objectives set out in them are achieved. The COP28 of the United Nations to be held in Dubai must be a turning point. This conference must produce agreements for the energy transition that are efficient, binding, and easy to monitor. It's incredible, isn't it? What's he doing? But the thing is, once again, friends, it used to be that you would say Francis is a globalist operative in the, <laughs> in the hire of Bill Gates and Klaus Schwab, that he sold the Vatican to the World Economic Forum, at least philosophically, at least practically. And people say, man, that's a, that's, a, that's a conspiracy theory. You're a nutshell. Not anymore. Right? I mean, in the middle of all this, the world is torched. The world is going up in smoke, abortion, the breakup of the family, borders gone, countries disappearing. And this old man sitting over there in Rome, I think I will write a sequel to Laudato Si. Hey, buddy, nobody cares. Francis, nobody cares. In fact, the video that we just showed is an official Vatican video at a Vatican YouTube channel. I don't know how, when I, when I looked at it after about a week of being up, it had something like 3,000 views. No, no, nobody cares, your, your holiness. But what it does do, again, this provides the most obvious proof to date. This, this sequel to Laudato Si provides the most obvious proof to date. I mean, you really, really have to be thick-headed you really have to be hiding your own Easter baskets now. If you can't recognize that Francis is a tool of the globalist cabal. Right? We can clearly see that now. <laughs> and then if you think about what they just did to us with their lockdown and their trust the science, right? Because what is this sequel? What is Laudatum Deum? It's trust the science on climate change, right? We just saw what happened. When they shut the whole world down, set kids years back in school, let old people die in nursing homes, made people sick, sick people sick all over the world. Okay, he totally blessed that. Now he's doing this, which has everything do, to, to do with the 15-minute cities and owning nothing and getting rid of cars and stopping eating beef and locking yourself down to save the planet. Francis is practically megaphoning broadcasting, I present a clear and present danger to you and your children of the world. That's what he's doing. You know, we might be able to call him the holy father of lockdowns. Because just as he did during COVID, he is now going to help them lock down the world again. And now this uber modernist globalist Jesuit pretends that he doesn't know why Jesus was crucified. Hmm, I don't know. Never been able to answer that one. <laughs> doesn't know why Jesus was crucified. Well, naturally, he's got to pretend that he doesn't know why Jesus was crucified because the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ obliterates his entire agenda. It obliterates his globalist friend's entire globalist plan for a new world order that will have no room for the Catholic Church or for Jesus Christ the King. Now he pretends he doesn't know why Jesus was crucified because the crucifixion of Jesus Christ speaks to the horror of sin which these globalist lunatics don't believe in. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ speaks to the necessity of baptism and the membership in a one true church founded by Jesus Christ which they formally reject. Jesus Christ didn't die for the brotherhood of man here on earth. Note to Francis, Jesus Christ did not die for the brotherhood of man. He didn't die for utopia here on earth. He, he died to make each and every one of us sons of God and heirs of heaven. 
And that's the little part of the Francis message that never, ever gets talked about anymore, does it? And friends, you have to understand this. This did not start with Francis. <laughs> this eclipsing of the church, eclipsing of Jesus Christ, forgetting what the crucifixion was all about, this has been a long time in coming. It's not you just got the synod making it official, swapping out communion with God for communion with man. <laughs> Sound familiar? It should. It's the Masonic Brotherhood of Man. <laughs> it's going on right now in Rome in the synod. They're establishing the Brotherhood of Man. And guess who gets in the way of that little plan? Every single time. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's why he's got to go. That's why he's got to be canceled. Let's take a practical example. When you boil it all down, at the end of the day, what is this ridiculous synod actually trying to accomplish? <clears throat> because there is an answer. I'm not just speaking generally. There's actually something that when you think about it, emerges as a very specific sort of common denominator. <laughs> and if you think this synod is about listening to the marginalized and the poor, well, I've got a bridge to sell you and maybe some swampland in Florida. Let's talk after the show. <laughs> no, it's all about communion, friends. And by communion, I mean sacrilegious communion. You know, the type that St. Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians, where he says, Whosoever shall eat this bread or drink the chalice of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. That's the way Catholics used to talk. Not anymore. Because Francis and friends, now they want to allow unrepentant public adulterers to receive communion unworthily. That's what's going on. That's why you have this confusion over what, how can this guy get away with it? When does God intervene, right? That's why you have so many cardinals and bishops and archbishops and priests standing up against him right now, and that number is going to increase over the month of October. Watch and see. He can't get away with this. And then after that, if he gets away with that, Team Francis wants to bless gay unions. Oh, they want to make women priests, but you know what? They're not going to do that one. That's the one that we're all going to go, whew. Look, the synod came and went, and they didn't have anything to say about ordaining women. In fact, they said they're not going to ordain women to the priesthood. Whew. You know, while well, they're blessing gay unions and letting unrepentant public adulterers go to communion at the end of the day. Um, there is a 2003 document from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith uh, against same-sex unions, and the Pope is obviously saying he uh, sees things a little differently. Uh, it is, it's, it's, it's momentous because he's saying it as Pope. He said it before as Archbishop of Buenos Aires. He's saying it on the record, uh, and he's being very clear. It's not simply he's tolerating it, he's supporting it. Well, why, what, what's that all about? Why are they doing that? Well, it's for the same reason. Communion again. Eucharist, right? So that the people living in same-sex unions, and you know here on this show we have spoken out in defense of those people time and time again, so-called LGBT folks, because the Catholic Church has been lying to them for 50 years now, but especially for the past 20 years. They're not getting the truth, okay? But those people living in same-sex unions so they can receive communion unworthily, that's what's going on here. Well, we're going to give you a blessing. We're a welcoming church. Come, come, come in. So what are they going to do after they welcome them and bless them? Say, you can't go to communion. Nuh-uh. <laughs> As John Wayne would say, that'll be the day. They're not going to stop them from going to communion. <laughs> you see how they work? Oh, you say, but it's just, a, it's just a few. They're just going for a few of them, not everybody, not across the board. They're just talking about exceptional cases, not everyone. Besides, we don't even know if they're practicing homosexual acts. These people are going to receive papal blessings for gay unions. <laughs> we don't know if they're practicing homosexuals. True, and, and, and isn't, 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 isn't that just the thing? That nobody inside the Vatican, with all this talk about blessing gay unions... Nobody wants to talk about what gay people do. We don't want to talk about the acts. That gets tricky. Because now you're just going to collide headlong into the catechism of the Catholic Church. It gets tricky. So let's just not talk about that. 
They just want to bless homosexual dudes living together in the same house and, you know, probably sleeping on separate couches, you know? That's, <laughs> that's probably what's going on. <sighs> Guys with the big microphones are gonna buy that. They're gonna buy it. They're gonna say, well, they're not talking about acts. They're talking about unions and charity and welcoming. <laughs> but you and I, friends, we can have this little conversation, can't we? What are these folks living in the gay unions? What are they doing? What are they doing at night? To be quite blunt, what do you think they're doing? And why doesn't the Vatican care about that? Because they want them to do that, to be blessed and welcomed, and then to go to communion. That's what this is all about. Now, well, thankfully, not everybody has fallen for this Barbara Streisand. Well, you cannot, the point, and we, we raise it in the dubium uh, with regard to the, I think it's number three, with regard to the same-sex unions, uh, you cannot bless uh, sinful acts. You, you cannot bless uh, a relationship which in itself uh, is involved with, with intrinsically evil acts. And, and therefore, it's, it's not possible to, to bless these unions in any way. And to, uh, we, yes, we are judges. We have to judge between what is right and what is wrong. And, and we know on the authority of, of divine revelation that, uh, that genital acts between people of the same sex are intrinsically evil. But your, but your eminence, it's, it's, it's okay. Come on, calm down. Francis came right out and said that the only way they're going to even consider blessing gay unions is we don't confuse it with marriage. We don't call it marriage. Okay? <laughs> Are you buying that one? Is anyone buying that one? I mean, seriously? Because I got a little question for you. What, what possible difference does it make <laughs> if the Vatican compares the gay unions to marriage or not? Nobody cares. The point is, again, the poor folks engaged in this, they're engaging in sodomy, a mortal sin that the Catholic Church teaches, cries to heaven for vengeance. The Catholic Church, in her official documents that never get shared with the gay and lesbian LGBTQRS folks, you see? You see, that, and, and that's the problem. So just how stupid does Francis think you are? Oh, it's not marriage. It's actually not marriage. It's just a gay union. We're just blessing the gay union. <laughs> Kind of a moron would fall for that. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but it's just in certain exceptional cases. It's only it's only sometimes. It's not every it's not every time. I remember, friends, when they were using that argument for communion in the hand, because that was, of course, the beginning of the attack on the Eucharist. That was the beginning of <laughs> doing things that were so egregious that now we got eighty percent of American Catholics don't even believe in the real presence anymore. But I remember when they were doing that communion in the hand. It was just a few cases, a few exceptional circumstances, a couple countries here and there, only in the countries where the abuse of communion in the hand had already been established, and we were just going to make an exception and let them continue. God knows why. You know, imagine, imagine if the police, the, the police law enforcement did that. Well, there's only a few places in town where murder is going on, so we'll let it go on there, but we're going to try to curb it through the rest of the town. Can you imagine how stupid that is? Yet the Vatican was doing that 30, 40, 50 years ago about with communion in the hand. And you say, well, yeah, but you know, that's, that's, that, 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 that's the, the reality is communion. You can do both. You can receive on the tongue. Can you? Can you? Oh, I realize that's on the book still, that you're supposed to be allowed to, to receive our Lord, the Blessed Sacrament on your tongue. But I'll tell you what, those of you who are still going to, going to the Novus Ordo Mass, uh, why don't you go and see what happens next Sunday when you try to receive communion on the tongue? It's probably going to look, well, something like this. He will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. And 
So there, friends, there is your church of accompaniment in action. A dad and his beautiful little daughter left kneeling, embarrassed, and abandoned on the floor in the aisle for trying to honor the creator of the world in the Eucharist. Gotta love that church of accompaniment, don't you? Mean, nasty, tyrannical church of accompaniment. But abuse of the Eucharist, friends, has always been at the heart of this revolution from the very beginning. Why? Well, there's several reasons, but I would think topping the, in the top three would be because Satan hates the fact that God so loved the world that he gave us his only son and then made his son available to us at every mass, every day throughout the entire world. That's the problem. That's what's got to stop. The devils hate the mass, and so do these guys. That's why they're trying to destroy the traditional Latin, cancel the traditional Latin mass. And they've been at it forever, right? Think how long they've been trying to destroy and cancel the Latin mass, the mass of Christendom, the mass of Padre Pio, the mass of all the saints and popes and martyrs. Back to Peter. <laughs> First they tore out the altar, and they stuck in a table so we could all have a little picnic at mass. And then communion in the hand, right? That was the crowning moment. And then they tore out the communion rails, and then they messed up the sanctuary, and then they brought in the ladies, and they brought in the altar girls, and pretty soon nobody knows what the hell is going on, right? What is this? The lay ministers began to come in, began eclipsing priests. You think that was an accident? Uh, if you don't have a sacrifice, what in the heck do you need a priest for? And now, finally, they want unrepentant sodomites and public adulterers to receive Holy Communion. And once again, it's all about profaning Christ in the Eucharist. That's what I think. I can't imagine what else it would be. And they're doing this now in the name of human fraternity. <laughs> we were struck last June. We did a show on this June, Pride Month, uh, when the Vatican organized this bizarre, what was it called? The Human Fraternity Day? Uh, <laughs> in St. Peter's Square is when it happened. They had a creature called Roberto Bolle, who's Italy's most famous homosexual dancer. Now, he's prancing around half naked up there, entertaining the little kids. And that was probably the worst of it. That was the worst of it. Uh, I asked, I asked uh, Bishop Schneider, in fact, Ath Athanasius Schneider, just last week about this. And here's what he had to say. Yes, of course, it, what, you, what you mentioned, it was an abomination, true, an abomination. We have to do penance and reparation for this abomination. Yeah, that's exactly right. An abomination, I would add, of desolation in the holy place. And what did you say it was called, Walter? The World Meeting on Human Fraternity. World Meeting on Human yeah. Fraternity. And we had some aerial shots. Nobody cared about that either. There was nobody in the piazza, but that's what they were, they were doing. That's what they had uh, going on that day in the Vatican. <laughs> Do you remember? Didn't they hand out some seeds? Handed out some seeds yeah, so people could go back home and plant human fraternity trees? Grow into a tree. Grow into uh, a yeah, tree all throughout like the world? Yeah. See if we can throw that up. And this is uh, uh, just an example. I don't know whether you have it. It was given to you, but you have to plant the seed, and the plant will grow is the seed of fraternity, and next year we will reconvene with this uh, young uh, new plant. So we plant the seed, and uh, uh, it will grow over time. Yes, and this is how fraternity grows. Ah, it's nothing if it isn't just so stupid, right? Maybe that's, maybe that's the point. I don't know anymore. But liberty, equality, fraternity, you get it? Brotherhood of man. That's what this is. Freemasons have been babbling about this since 1717. Freemasonry is the brotherhood of all men, regardless of color or creed or political beliefs. That's the wonderful thing about Freemasonry. It rises above all of those things. It's just like, kind of like the New World Order. It's bigger than a religion. It includes all religions and no religions and the one world religion. All are welcome. 
but you sure as heck don't need to be a Catholic anymore. And this is why, friends, why Francis has been doing things like saying, oh, atheists, oh, sure, they can go to, they can go to heaven. Proselytism, you know, this is solemn nonsense, according to Francis. You get it? Christ's church be damned, basically, right? We're doing something new now, something different, something global, all about fraternity and the brotherhood. And this is something strikes me. Did you ever hear or do you remember Bishop Tony Palmer? Remember that name? Well, he was an evangelical Episcopal church bishop of some sort. Uh, and back at the beginning of the pontificate of Pope Francis, he made quite a stir because he and Francis were, were like that. They were very tight. But if you look at something that happened then, you can really get an idea of what we're seeing now at this synod. I'm talking January of 2014. Francis made Bishop Tony a special envoy to a charismatic evangelical leadership conference hosted by Kenneth Copeland. That's a problem in itself, but we'll leave that one go. And then during that Copeland conference, Bishop Palmer presented a, a video message. I'll try to throw it up on the screen here in a minute, or maybe Walter can put it up now if you can get an idea of it. Um, and then it, it, this, this message, Francis, it turns out, uh, wanted this message recorded, and it was recorded by Bishop Tony on Bishop Tony's personal iPhone. Que questa separazione finisca e ci dia la comunione, la nostalgia di quell'abbraccio di qua nel, nel quale parla la Sacra Scrittura. Quando i fratelli di Giuseppe affamati sono andati a Egitto per comprare per poter mangiare lì hanno trovato qualcosa più del pasto hanno trovato il fratello Shortly thereafter, and not long before he died, Bishop Tony had connected all the dots on this communion issue. Here he is. Pope Francis himself is the one who is asking us for full unity and full communion. What is striking is that he awakens us to the fact that the real communion is not the bread, but the brother. <laughs> it's not the bread of life, friends. It's the brother that we need the brotherhood, the brotherhood of man. <laughs> He's not gonna get away with this. So I wanna, I wanna leave you with this. There's absolutely no future to any of this. They're desperately trying to ram it down our throats. More and more people are standing up against it. Why? Because it's simply not Catholic. It's just a globalist new ideology. Or ideology. And this is why the worldwide coalition of Catholics opposing this stuff is taken off like it is. And this is why I told you, I want to leave you with some, some not, not just words of hope, but images of hope. A genuine event filled with hope. And I need you to take, take, take this with you at, at the conclusion of tonight's program. We have so much to be grateful for. We have so much to be grateful to God and to each other as we begin to see clearly what has to happen here. So last week, again, the Catholic Identity Conference, it became so clear to me what we need to do. We've been saying down here for so long. You know, whether Francis is a pope or not, <laughs> you got to keep the faith, you got to unite the clans, you got to resist Francis, you got to stick close to your family, stick close to the sacraments, right? That's what you got to do, because things are rapidly changing. And we are no longer friends on our own as we were with this newspaper 30 years ago, certainly 50 years ago when my father started it, there's this one bishop who was like, wait a minute, what's going on? Things are changing dramatically. Last week, I interviewed Gerhard Cardinal Muller, top theologian in the church, head of the CDF under Pope Benedict. Now, right now, the same Cardinal Muller, after he left the, the CIC interview, he's in Rome, raising his voice against the hostile takeover of the Catholic Church. Two nights ago, he was on EWTN, Totally ignoring, apparently, Francis' attempt to block all synod fathers from speaking to the press. Oh, horrors of horrors. Don't tell anybody what we're doing. He's on, Cardinal Muller's on EWTN speaking out against what is likely to happen at the synod. 
I think it's very clear in the, the Old Testament, the commandments in the New Testament, that all sins in the, the sexual, sexual behavior outside the, the legitimate uh, matrimony is a mortal sin and that can, nobody can change it. It is a word of God. But it wasn't just prelates. Again, last week, CIC Vatican journalist Edward Penton spoke at the CIC. And again, two nights ago, uh, he was on international television on EWTN with Raymond Arroyo. Is what he said. And the key part of it is, is sort of, uh, listening to everyone, it seems, but except those who are upholding orthodoxy and uh, and the church's magisterium that's been taught for 2,000 years. And this is to say nothing of, you know, the fact that Bishop Athanasius Schneider was at the CIC, as was core Bishop Spinoza of the Maronite Rite, Bishop Strickland, God, God bless Bishop X, he gave an unbelievable talk. There was a, how, was, how long was the standing ovation for that after he... It was the longest standing ovation we've ever had at the CIC. It was unbelievable. You just, once again, you could feel the grace of the moment, which I think was the grace of God just animating that room, so happy, so full of hope, that there's no reason to give up or leave the church, and we're gonna be okay. That was the message. While we also said to the Vatican, we're not gonna, we're not gonna put up with it this time. We will resist you to the face like you've never seen. And then to cap it off, this beautiful Bishop Strickland, you know, who's new to the traditional thing, certainly traditional Latin Mass, he offers the traditional Latin Mass for all 750 attendees of the CIC. And I said at the time, this, this was like, you see some of that on the screen now, this was probably one of the most inspiring Masses I've ever seen as he, as he, as he offered the Mass, even though he's still in the process of learning it. It was beautiful. In fact, I was moved to tears, as many people were. <laughs> and then yesterday, just a few days after the... CIC had ended. He's just back in the trenches at it again. He tweeted this out. He says, if those living in sinful relationships of adultery or sodomy can receive a blessing, where does it stop? Thus, every person in a life of habitual sin can receive a blessing also with no need for repentance. This cannot stand. It renders Christ irrelevant. We must say no. It renders Christ irrelevant. That's what I was just saying. They're making Christ irrelevant. I stand, therefore, with Strickland. I stand with Cardinal Burke, Cardinal Brandmuller, Sarah, Zen, Sandoval, you know, the latest batch of dubia cardinals who present the strongest opposition in the world to Francis and the Synod. People say, well, they didn't do anything last time. What's the matter with you, Mike? Didn't they? Didn't they? I'm a Catholic journalist. I'm a newspaper guy. I got to tell you, when, when Cardinal Burke and the, the original Dubia Cardinals got busy with the first intervention, the first Dubia, when they were talking about Amoris Letizia, Cardinal Burke and those Cardinals gave us our, our marching orders. We didn't worry anymore. It was gloves off time. Yeah, he could have said more. could have been stronger. He never, you know. But the point is, Cardinal Burke, as rightful authority in the church, sent a message all the way down the chain of command, resist, because we are. You see? So you can, you can quibble about it, you can kibitz about it, you wish he had done more, you wish he was this, you wish he was that. But he's the one that we have. In the middle of this crisis in the church, which in many ways we deserve, because of our betrayal also, you know, of, of, of our duty as Catholics, still, God in his mercy sends us these shepherds, these priests, these bishops, these cardinals, to stand with us, to stand with Christ, to stand with the church, to let us all know they still believe, you see? And just look at what a threat. You can quibble about it. You can take your little pot shots at Burke, Cardinal Burke. <laughs> but what's dominating the news this week? Who's dominating the news this week? He is. He is. And the cardinals that stood with him, why? Because the church is hierarchical. I can run my mouth down here all month, and it doesn't ever have the same impact as a single cardinal standing up and speaking the truth and defending Christ. They're literally Francis's wake-up screaming nightmare, and they are inspiring thousands of Catholics and priests around the world to make the same stand. Don't you see how it works? Please, friends, I, I beg you, let's declare an international ceasefire and the little ratty trad squabbling, 
in the circular firing squads. Let's just shut up for a month, shall we? Let's just see what happens during and then after the Synod. And especially during the Synod, especially right now, let us pray for these guys who are taking the stand. The people in rightful authority who are taking the stand. Let's pray for them. Let's stand with them. And more importantly, let's let the Vatican see us standing with them, not fighting with each other, because the Cardinals aren't going far enough. Just zip it, stand together, stand with them, and let's see where this goes. I'll tell you what, for the next month, that's exactly what I intend to do. <laughs> I'm going to go to Rome and see what I can do there, covering this. I'm going to see if I can find these Cardinals and just let them know. Just let them know, we got your back, whatever it's worth, for whatever that's worth, we will be your greatest defenders in the world. So keep it up, keep going. And I wanna be speaking for every member of this audience as well, for all of you. I wanna give them that message from all of us, especially the American traditional Catholics. We stand with you. The thing is, friends, I've said this before, and I'll close on this. <laughs> Whether Francis is the Pope or not, we need to resist him to his face with everything that we've got, because I believe with all my heart that that's exactly what God wants me to do. And by the way, it's the most effective strategy that we can come up with. So please, for God's sake, the sake of the church, the sake of your children, stand with these few brave successors of the apostles, and let's just walk with them. Let's walk with them all the way to the foot of the cross, if need be. And after that, let's just let God take it from there.